OK, uh, I'm going to talk more about uh, Every Student Succeeds Act and uh, how it affects impact aid and what used to be Title VII and is now uh, Title VI. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, again, I'm Jim Taylor with the ACLU. I'm the legal director. Um, and you're thinking to yourself, well, what does this have to do with the American Civil Liberties Union? Um, part of what we're doing in Montana is we have a, a, a racial, part of our strategic plan is, is a commitment to racial justice. And we have uh, developed a racial justice project working with the law school. Um, and we really want to advance education as a civil right. Our executive director, Caitlin Borgman, is here today, has really championed what we've been doing with racial justice in Montana. So although you think of us as suing people, we do a lot more than just sue people. Um, our racial justice project has a number of components. Uh, voting rights has always been a big issue for the uh, ACLU in Montana. We were the attorneys in the Windy Boy case. We were the attorneys in the old person case. We were the, uh, I was involved a couple of, just a couple of years ago and we sued the Wolf Point School District about how that particular school district was set up. And I can tell you our success in that particular case has had ramifications for the work that we do around the state. As soon as the federal court entered a consent decree in our favor and against the school board, uh, word was out in Indian country immediately about about that and we get a different response now from school districts because they know um, we're not just showing up and talking we have the resources to back up what we're saying so we're very interested in voting rights including voting rights on school district cases um, we're very involved in criminal justice reform in Montana especially as it affects uh, Indian people we know we're very clear about the disproportionate impact of the criminal justice system um, on the native population Especially Native women. Native women, if you look at you know, Indians, are about six and a half percent of the general population in Montana. They're 33 to 36 percent of the women in, in, uh, incarcerated in the in the women's prison in Montana. Um, we're interested in discrimination claims involving Native people and others. We're in, interested in reproductive freedom issues uh, throughout Indian Country, and we're going to be starting additional research on that. We do governance training for tribes. Um, we, part of our racial justice project is, you know, tribal governments also commit civil rights violations. You have rights in the Indian Civil Rights Act, but um, our philosophy and our uh, commitment is that we're not going to go around and sue tribes because although we might be successful in a particular case, long term, um, if the white folks from Missoula come in and sue you, you can win the battle and lose the war. What we want to do is train tribes about better compliance with the Indian Civil Rights Act. We did a training uh, two years ago with the law school here on the Flathead Reservation about the Indian Civil Rights Act. So our work on, on governance for tribes is, is to do training. Um, we're very interested in education as a civil right. As you know, Montana has a particular constitutional uh, provision that recognizes education as a civil right. It recognizes the unique cultural heritage of, of the Indians in Montana. So we've done these trainings. We've been to all seven reservations. We've done an additional training in Missoula. We're doing this one now, and, and this will go live online here in a bit. So as Malian said in a legal analysis, you always begin at the beginning. Um, this is kind of what I think of Montana when I think of the beginning. It's my favorite Charlie Russell painting, When the Land Belonged to God. Uh, but in, in terms of legal analysis, we always start with treaty rights. So for the Flathead, um, it's Hellgate Treaty of 1855, and I won't read it all to you, but in Article 5, there is an educational right for Flathead. So anytime we're, you're discussing educational issues um, on the Flathead Reservation, you start with Article 5 of the Hellgate Treaty. Um, now, I, because this is going to be available, I just want to run very quickly through some of the other treaty provisions that apply other places. The Fort Laramie Treaty of 1867 in Article 7, which affects, I believe, the Crow and, and the Fort Peck reservations. Um, the Blackfeet Treaty of Fort Benton has a provision in uh, Articles 8 and 11. Um, for Fort Belknap, the agreement at Fort Berthold, Fort Berthold from 1866 in Article 7. Um, for Fort Belknap, the agreement with the Gravant in 1868, Articles 4 and 8. Um, the Treaty with the Northern Cheyenne and the Northern Arapaho 
has a provision in Article 4. Um, there are also some other things that are not treaties but are worth looking at. Sweetgrass Hills Agreement of 1887, Article 3, Agreement of 1895 for Fort Belknap, and some, a variety of Crow Acts, uh, Agreement to Sell Crow Lands in 1891 and the Crow Act of 1920 also have specific educational rights that you should be thinking of when you begin an analyzing any of these issues. So you always begin with the treaty analysis. <clears throat> and you say, well, how do I do that? Well, you can call Maylin. You, the, the Indian Law Clinic at the University of Montana, Blewett School of Law at the University of Montana, um, is really good on, on these kinds of issues. And they're available to talk with you on any of these things. We're also available. So just a couple things on legal interpretation of treaties. There are some basic principles that apply in any treaty analysis. First thing is ambiguous expressions in the treaties are always resolved in favor of the tribe. So if you're not really clear what something means, then you would say, well, how would the tribes interpret this? Um, and that's the second principle. Treaties are always interpreted as the Indians themselves would have understood this. So you're not necessarily limited to the exact language of the treaty, but more what it would have meant to the tribes. Um, they're, Treaties are always supposed to be liberally construed in favor of the tribes. Um, and, and treaties are not a concession. Uh, U.S. got peace and land concessions, but it's not a grant of rights to the Indians. It's a reservation of rights, uh, but a grant of rights from them. So these are, these are rights that they, that they, ret that they retain. So let's look at some data for the Flathead Reservation, because that always helps. OPI always tracks the number of Indian students throughout the state. So you can go to their website and, and always get this data. This, the data we have is a little bit behind. It's 2013, but here are all the schools um, on the Flathead Reservation. And the, this column over here is, uh, this is the total number of students, and this is the percentage of native students in the, in the column on the far right. For this is Polson, Ronan, and then here are the rest of the schools, Arlie, St. Ignatius, Hot Springs, Dixon, Charlotte, and Dayton. <clears throat> um, the federal funding statutes are now uh, Title VI, which used to be Title VII, uh, Title VII, which is Impact Aid, and Johnson O'Malley, which was Title X before. Um, here's the funding that comes to the Flathead Reservation. Uh, from, from the federal government. This is again, this is 2013 numbers, but you can see that you get about um, six million, a little over six million total in federal dollars because of the presence of Indian students and exempt Indian lands. And you can also see by looking at it, um, the amount that you get for Johnson O'Malley is pretty small. The amount you get for uh, these columns show the old, the old titles, so they're, they're a little bit misleading. But what was Title VII is now Title VI. It's a larger number than Johnson O'Malley, but it's really dwarfed by uh, what you get from Impact Aid. That's the primary source of funding. If you look at, the, at the, uh, what state money you also get on the Flathead Reservation, and this is for all students on the Flathead Reservation, you get about, in 2000, fiscal year 2012, you got a little over $26 million in state funding for all the students on the Flathead Reservation. So when you, when you compare those two things, um, Impact Aid by itself was 20% of all the school funding, state and federal, on the reservation. 24%, so a quarter of all the funding was Impact Aid. Um, the reservation literally could not operate without that money. If they didn't get this money, schools here would have to shut down. So, and all these, and we're going to talk some more about consultation. It's a, it's a theme for today, but impact aid also requires consultation. And you have tremendous authority if you exercise it. If you don't exercise it, you're not going to have it, but it's there. It's there for the taking. Um, <clears throat> this is just a quick rundown of what impact aid is uh, on all the other reservations. On Blackfeet, it's about 45% of all the funding. Rocky Boy, it's 56%. Fort 
Fort Belknap, it's 82%. Fort Peck, it's 31%. Northern Cheyenne, it's 53% of all school funding. In Crow, it's 72%. So it really varies from reservation to reservation, but you can see it's a huge number everywhere. So the Every Student Succeeds Act um, really reflects almost universal uh, discontent with what I call No Student Left Untested, the old No Child Left Behind Act. Um, everybody hated it. Schools hated it. States hated it. The federal government wasn't really happy with it. Um, it really was unusual for Congress, especially this Congress, to agree on anything. But they actually did agree on that, except for the Montana delegation. Um, it passed the House on a vote of 359 to 64. Representative Zinke did vote for it. It passed the Senate 85 to 12, and one of those 12s um, was Senator Daines who voted against it. Uh, but Senator Tester voted in favor of it. Um, it was signed into law by President Obama uh, December 10th of last year. Uh, testing is reduced under uh, Every Student Succeeds Act, and I'm not going to go through all of it, but there's less testing than there used to be. There still is some mandatory testing in third to eighth grades uh, on reading and math, and um, also once in grades 10 to 12, and there's still some testing in science, but, but the, the actual total amount of testing is significantly reduced. <clears throat> Interventions are reduced. Under, under No Child Left Behind, if a school wasn't performing up to what it was supposed to perform, there was an intervention that the, that the, the federal government was involved with. Um, and it wasn't pleasant for the school and involved, could involve loss of funding. Um, the number of interventions will be reduced and the ways they are conducted are no longer going to be done by the federal government. It will be up to the states on how that happens. Again, this is another piece where consultation is important. And as the state develops its uh, comprehensive plan, that's the place where tribes need to be involved in talking about What's going to happen if schools don't perform? How are we going to manage that? Um, what's going to be the response? Um, federal government is no longer involved in teacher evaluation. That is left exclusively to the states now. <clears throat> um, it's going to take a while for the law to be completely rolled out. My recollection is I think it's September 1 of 2017, it's supposed to be uh, fully implemented. Um, and, and I've got a number of references up here. Don't write these down. It'll be on the, on the presentation. But if you want to go read about what the transition process is going to be, here's a link from the Department of Education that explains it to you. Um, in any new piece of federal legislation, there's almost always federal regulations that come about. And under Every Student Succeeds Act, there's a different process being used called negotiated rulemaking. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, usually with administrative regulations, what happens is the law comes out and the agency decides, well, here's the regulations we need. And then they, they publish them. There's a notice period where people can comment on them. and then. They'll decide if they're going to make changes, and then they'll issue the final regulations. That's not how it works with negotiated rulemaking. What happens is um, a group of individuals is identified as stakeholders, and they go to them and they say, well, here are the areas we need regulations on. What do you think? Can you, com can you come up with uh, regulations that, that answer these questions? And these uh, stake once the stakeholders are identified, then they work with a neutral third party and they have to reach consensus, meaning everybody agrees. Um, if you want to read about that particular process, here's a link to, uh, again, from the Department of Education that talks about uh, how this is the negotiated rulemaking process works. So the important part in this is, of course, who are the stakeholders? Who who are they looking to to develop these regulations? And I have a list of all of them. 
Um, the tribal ones are here. There were two tribal members um, that were part of it, but the whole group was state administer, administrators and boards of education, local administrators and local boards of education, tribal leadership, parents and students, teachers, uh, principals, other school leaders, paraprofessionals, civil rights community, uh, business community, uh, and those were all the people that were involved. And all these people got together and they had a series of meetings about issues that they thought we needed regulations for under Every Student Succeeds. Um, they met three times. The last time was just last week. And they were able to achieve uh, consensus on um, some issues, including some testing issues, but they weren't able to agree on everything. Um, and the meetings are concluded. They just schedule three of them, and that's it. So under negotiated rulemaking, um, here's a rule they did come up with that relates to our discussion today. Um, and it relates to um, native language training, that even though you're required to train in English, it also allows for training in native languages. As long as the English language requirements are met, uh, basic language instruction can take place in native languages up to the eighth grade. So that, that was a, a positive thing that came out of the negotiated rulemaking. Um, they have a new section defining what Native American means and what Alaskan natives are. And that was a positive development. And again, here's a link if you want to read what they were able to agree on and what they weren't. Um, there's actually there's three of them. But it, they didn't agree on everything. So here's the process. And this is different than it is um, in, any, in any other rulemaking. Um, the department can decide what to do. Are we going to move forward with just the things they agreed on? Do we need more regulations? Uh, if it decides to proceed with regulations, um, it can either go with what the group came up with, it can add a language of its own, um, but before they submit this stuff for uh, public comment, it has to go to the Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions of the Senate and the Committee on Education and Workforce in the House of Representatives and other relevant congressional committees and Congress can provide comments about the proposed regulations and the department will include and seek to address in a public rulemaking record. So Congress gets to have a say now on the regulations because the negotiating rule process was not completely successful. And I have a little bit of concern about, given our current Congress, how successful this will be, but, but we'll see. This will happen probably this summer. But once, once the final regulation is decided, then it will go to a public comment period. And we will notify people that are interested, both on our website and our Facebook group, uh, about when and how you can comment. And when those regs come out, we'll post them for people to, to review along with our analysis of them. Um, it's supposed to be fully implemented by July of next year. Now, OPI Montana, I saw a, a presentation that they recently did they're trying to get their state plan implemented, submitted by this summer, um, which is really fast. Uh, so the tribes and the Indian community needs to be involved in that discussion. Now with uh, Superintendent Juno, I, I don't think that'll be a big issue. I'm sure she's reaching out to the tribes, but n between now and this summer, uh, July 15th is when that consultation needs to take place. Um, and Montana has to, again, back to the, the uh, consultation piece, Montana has to requir is required to include the tribes in a timely and meaningful manner in developing the state's um, consolidated plan. So uh, under Every Student Succeeds Act, there have been some changes on who can carry out ESSA activities for predominantly Indian or Alaska Native children but it also includes Indian tribes as providers. It includes a tribally sanctioned educational authority like CSKT's tribal ed and tribal ed departments around the state and other tribes. Uh, it includes BIE schools like um, 
two eagle. It and this is all from section 3112 of the Act. And so uh, my reference is in here because because the SSA is not codified yet. I'll just have references throughout the presentation on where you can look it up in the Act itself. <clears throat> so pro programs authorized under the SSA that serve Indian children may also include programs of instruction, teacher training, curriculum development, evaluation, and assessment that are specifically designed for Indian children learning and studying native languages as long as one of the outcomes is also increased proficiency. Back to what I said in the previous slide. Um, you can have native language programs as part of the public school curriculum as long as there's also instruction that takes place in English. Yes? I have a question. So that's one thing we struggle with is getting language back into the schools. So we talk about funding um, sources in the uh, Johnson O'Malley. I mean, if, if you know, you talked about the funding that goes into the general uh, budget. Is, can that money be used to fund that I mean, Yes. Uh, the question is, uh, can Johnson O'Malley funding yeah. be used to, to fund a native language teacher? And the answer is yes. Also, again, as we'll talk about impact aid, when the school is developing its proposal on what it's going to do with impact aid money or Title VII money, you can say, we want someone teaching native language as part of the curriculum. That can be part of the tribal, the tribal input. I am saying that can happen. Now, under Johnson O'Malley, the question is, can the um, impact aid funding be used to fund those uh, native language teachers? And the answer is yes. If, if that's part of the tribal input and that's what the tribes want to see, that can be part of the consultation process. The thing about Johnson O'Malley money is, IECs just control it. The school has no say in it. You decide how it gets spent. So that's something you can do directly. The other is part of the consultation process. So we can, it's not that you can go in and demand this, but you can say, this is what we want. Let's discuss what we can do. So Malin mentioned the uh, consultation about family engagement centers. Now this is a new thing, I believe, under ESSA. Uh, family engagement centers are to carry out parent education, family engagement, and education programs. Because you know, if you raise kids, the hardest thing to do is to get the family in engaged. And you know, the, the most heartbreaking thing that we've seen around the state is that the schools that are the real problems, it's not families that are not involved. It's the families that are involved, that they want their kids to succeed. We have students that are great students that are involved in athletics and they're still getting pushed around by the schools. Um, that shouldn't ever happen. But the new ESSA allows for something called family engagement centers. These can be statewide, but there's also ability for the tribes to apply for money to establish one of these, to get <coughs> tribal parents more involved in their students' education. Um, it can provide uh, training and technical assistance uh, to state educational agencies, local agencies, schools um, that carry out these programs. And tribes are eligible for these grants. So think about that. Section 4502 and 40 through 4505 of ESSA, tribes can apply for grants to get Indian parents more involved in the education of their children. Yes? The state can. They're designed to be statewide centers. However, there's an exception, and it allows for tribes to, to become involved. So every tribe in the state, if they wanted to, could apply for one of these grants. But it has to come through the tribes, is my understanding. So what do we know so far about the changes that ESSA has made to, to uh, Title VI or Title VI and Impact Aid? For Title VI, um, the purpose of the act, this is the, the grant program that used to be Title VII, uh, is to support the efforts of local education agencies, uh, tribes and organizations, and other entities um, to meet the unique educational and culturally centered academic needs of Indian students so that the students can meet challenging state academic standards. 
to ensure Indian students gain knowledge and understanding of native communities, languages, tribal histories, traditions, and culture, and to ensure that teachers, principals, school leaders who serve Indian students will have the ability to provide culturally appropriate and effective instruction and support to each of those students. So that's what, the, in, in essence, the money is going to, supposed to be used for. There's another purpose as well um, that's similar to support programs that, again, meet these same requirements. Um, so these are formula grants and they're competitive grants. So some of them, if you meet the formula and there's funding, you get the funding. Some of them are competitive, so you have to compete against other jurisdictions. Um, and I won't run through all of these. Th there is a new grant program from the federal government to support Indian and Alaskan Native immersion programs. Don't get your hopes up. As I read it, it's about 1.1 million for the nation. So that's not a lot of money. But um, if you're interested, the sooner you get moving on this, the better, because you'll be competing with other jurisdictions. Uh, the, the more complete proposal you can get in, the better. This is in si section 6133 of ESSA, part of Title VI. Uh, I won't run through all these, but these are the kinds of programs you can fund with um, Title VI money. The first one being activities to support Native American language programs uh, and language restoration programs. So you can apply for a Title VI grant separate and apart from the immersion grant um, that's on language. Anyway, I'll let you read through these. Yes. So, so the question was, and I'm just repeating the questions for the videotape. The question was, can you use it for early childhood? And Malin points out that number three is specifically about early childhood education. Um, And then here are the rest of the things you can apply for. Um, you can apply for Title VI funding to prevent violence, suicide, and substance abuse, um, acquisition of equipment for purposes necessary to carry out the grant, um, culturally responsive teaching and learning strategies, family literacy services, um, more about unique cultural and educational needs of Indian children, including incorporating appropriately qualified tribal elders and seniors, dropout prevention for Indian students, um, and strategies for meet educational needs of at-risk at Indian students. So there are a lot of good things here that you can use um, that money for, that Title VI money. Now, the applications themselves, again, and we'll go back to the consultation piece, have to be developed with a participation and written approval of a committee. Now, we were hoping that under ESSA, they would have simplified the consultation piece and not have a separate IEC for Johnson O'Malley, a Title VII or a Title VI committee, and a different process for impact aid, but that didn't happen. This is, this is the old process. So you're going to have to have a separate uh, Title VI committee um, that has to approve the language. It includes parents and family members of children, Indian children in the, in the school, representative tribes and Indian lands located within 50 miles of any school, the agency will serve the tribes have any children in the school, so any, the, the Flathead tribes would have to be involved in, in uh, any Title VI application. Teachers in the school, and if appropriate, and I think this is new, um, Indian students attending secondary schools in the LEA. So uh, if there's an appropriate student you'd want involved in that process, there's a mechanism to get them involved, high school students. Um, and the LEA has to do outreach to the fa parents and family members to implement these applications. So there's, they have to have Indian parents on the committee, they have to have tribal representatives on the committee, and they have to do outreach um, to other Indian parents who are not involved in, in, the, in the application. <clears throat> so they have to be involved in developing developing the application. They can't just bring it to, to, to someone and say, oh, sign off on this. You have to be involved in the actual development of this. Um, LEA must have policies and procedures, including the hiring of personnel, as will ensure the program is operated in evaluation in consultation with and involvement of parents and family members of the children to be served. So another 
reference to consultation. Every time consultation comes up, that should pop up in your mind what consultation means as, as Mei Lin has discussed. Uh, it has to also, and this is important, detail how teachers new to the community will be trained and prepared to work with Indian children. So you have a say on that. You're bringing in a bunch of new teachers, never worked in Indian country, probably not Indian. Um, what do you want them, what kind of training do you want them to have before they work with the students? You still have no contact with the Indian community, yep. I under, absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's what this is aimed at. Um, and then there has to be periodically assessment of all uh, the progress of all Indian children in the LEA and provide the results of the assessments to the committee we've talked about and to the tribal government. So your tribal government should be getting not identifiable information about the students, but regular reports from all schools that get Title VI money. How are the Indian students doing in the school? And if you're not, talk to tribal ed. And they can go sharp stick the council and say, we need this information. We're entitled to it as a matter of federal law. So you have to establish proof that the application, you know, whatever the activity is, is going to benefit Indian children. Um, you have to provide the name of each Indian child. Um, enrollment number if it's available, if it's not available. Enrollment number of parents or grandparents. Um, and if that's not available, other information may be considered. Now we don't know yet what that's going to be, and I know that's been a problem in some areas. Um, it's been a problem in Missoula. This is another thing that we're waiting on regulations for. We're hoping the regulations will clarify if you have a student you know is Indian, but you don't have enrollment information, how do you demonstrate that for purposes of counting them under Title VI applications? Uh, there is now national funding, this is new funding, to do research on best approaches to education of Indian children. This is a great place for tribal colleges. We have seven tribal colleges in the state. This is a great place for tribal colleges to jump into the picture. So um, it can also be research on evaluating any of these programs, uh, collecting and analyzing data on the needs of, of Indian students, promoting self, tribal self-determination in education, uh, improving collaboration with state and local agencies, and tribes and tribal educational agencies are eligible for this funding. So SKC is probably eligible for this trend, funding. Uh, tribal education is eligible for this funding. If you want to get involved in this picture, there's now additional national funding to do that. There's also, and I believe this is also new, a National Advisory Council on Indian Education. Um, it requires that there be 15 members for the commission. They're appointed by the president <clears throat> from different geographic regions. And the duties are to, uh, to advise the Secretary of Education on uh, funding Indian education. And also, if there's, a, as if there's a vacancy in the Director of Indian Education and the Secretary of Education, uh, make recommendations to them and say, this is somebody we think you should consider for the post. So it allows more tribal input on those important uh, policy decisions. And also to make funding recommendations to Congress on Indian education. Um, we'll talk in a second about both Johnson O'Malley, which is woefully underfunded, and Impact Aid. Impact Aid, as I understand the congressional reports, is capped for the next three years. Now the formula changes about who gets the money, but I believe the amount totally that's available nationwide is capped for the next three years. And again, this is section 6141 of ESSA. Um, again, looping back to consultation in Title VI, um, has to be timely and meaningful consultation with American Indians, with appropriate officials from Indian tribes, including Title VI of the Act, as well as any other program under the Act. Um, so keep in mind this language about consultation, because this 
both on consultation and documentation. This applies anytime consultation comes up. So there's the uh, Clinton, memo, uh, Clinton executive order, there's the Obama memo, and there's a variety of statutory references. And you should, whenever you're raising these issues, you should hit them with all of these, every one of them, because they all apply. So impact aid, uh, the changes, there are some changes in terms of, of how the formulas are calculated, but there's no major changes in the funding. It is capped, as I understand it. Um, the eligibility standards is not Indian children, but children residing on Indian land. So if there's non-Indian students residing on trust land, they still count. If you have a non-Indian student uh, living anywhere on trust land, they count towards impact aid. They count towards the calculation. And, and the reason is because impact aid is designed to, to uh, replace the tax base that's lost for um, Indian land that's in trust. Um, oh, this is a change too. Uh, it includes children that would have resided in Indian lands except their housing is undergoing renovation or rebuilding. This is new. Um, so if a child was in a tribal housing project that's being remodeled, but now it's not living on um, trust land, you can still count them. It requires a certification process, but if Indian students have to move off of trust land because there's work being done on the building, you can still count them towards uh, impact aid, and that's, that's, a that's a change in ESSA. And this is from section 7003 of ESSA. <clears throat> so, uh, and this is, this is an important consultation piece. An LEA, which is a school, with children residing on Indian lands must establish Indian policies and procedures to make sure Indian children participate in programs and in activities funded, funded by impact aid on equal basis with other children. Parents and Indian tribes are consulted and involved in planning and developing the programs and activities. Again, that's the same language as in Title VI. Remember what we said about where that funding goes. If they're taking impact aid dollars and putting it in the general fund, this applies to everything the school does. Everything. And the, yes, consultation has to be timely and meaningful. Yes? I have a question. Where do the schools get the money to hire their coaches? Would it be under the general fund? Uh, I believe it is. I believe the question is where do the schools get the money to hire their coaches? And I believe it is from the general fund. So we would be able to have a say in who the coaches are? Not necessarily in who the coaches are, but what the process is for hiring them. I'm sorry. And Mia. And the criteria for them, for the coaches. And I know there are huge problems with coaches in Indian country. Um, parents and tribes have to be allowed an opportunity to present their views on programs and activities that are funded. Again, dollars go into impact aid, that's everything. And it has to be timely, it has to be meaningful. Parents and tribes have to receive copies of any applications, evaluations, and program plans. So uh, anything that it's going to be used for, you're entitled to copies of. And the tribes is entitled to a copy, and, and the tribal education departments are entitled to a copy. And that's in section 7004 of ESSA. Um, this, there's not a lot of changes in, from the prior law on this. Um, again, there's a record keeping requirement for impact aid. They have to maintain records that demonstrate compliance with the SSA requ demonstrate compliance with the SSA requirements. Um, now, if the in situations like <coughs> Browning, where the school board's all Indian, the the tribes can issue a written waiver to say we don't need all that stuff. We we trust you. You're doing a good job. But unless they do that, they're entitled to this information. Uh, and this is in section 7004 of ESSA. This is a really important part. Let's say there's been a consultation, 
you don't think it was timely or you don't think it was meaningful, they didn't listen to anything the tribes told them. They went ahead and did what they wanted anyway. What can we do about it? There is a process where the tribes can step in and have something to do about it. And again, impact aid, we're talking about 24% of the total funding for education on the Flathead Reservation. Um, so a tribe or its designee, so it could be the tribal council, maybe they say tribal ed, you do this. They can file a written complaint with the Secretary of Education about any action of a local education agency, a school, taken pursuant to or relevant to the requirements of Section 7004. So anything that's relevant to impact aid activities, if, it hasn't, if there's a problem, the tribes can file a complaint with the Department of, of Education. And this happens, I mean, this happens for the federal government at, at blazing speed. Um, the right extends not just to tribes that are here, but any tribe that has students in attendance at the LEA. So if there's a Navajo student attending school here, the Navajo schools, the Navajo tribes have the same right to file a complaint with the Secretary of Education. Uh, and there's an expedited hearing process. The hearing will take place within 40 days of when the complaint is filed. And in, in federal administrative law terms, that's like faster than lightning. So this, there, there actually will be a hearing. I think there's only 10 days to choose the hearing examiner and then 30 days to have the hearing, so a total of 40 days. Question. It's whoever the tribe designates. So they could designate tribal ed, they could designate Johnny R. Lee, they could designate, it's up to the tribes to make that decision. Um, and if, the, if there's a hearing and the secretary says, this is a problem, school you go fix it, and the school says, well, I'm not going to, then the remedy is okay, you just lost impact aid, and you go back to those numbers I gave you about the schools here, how many schools on the Flathead Reservation can walk away from impact aid? I bet it's right at zero. So it, it is a lot of authority. You're entitled to be involved in developing the policies and procedures that apply for impact aid. And if they're not complied with, it has to be the tribes that take action, but the tribes can file a complaint and there's an expedited process the secretary makes a ruling, and the secretary rules in your favor, it gets fixed or they lose the money. And again, that's section 7004 of ESSA. Not, not much change from the prior law. Uh, so it just in closing, and then if there's any other questions, we'll be glad to take them. Uh, things to watch for in the coming months. Um, we expect fingers crossed, draft uh, regulations for ESSA this summer, unless Congress does something exotic or fails to do something at all. Hopefully we'll have these regulations this summer. When they come out, we'll notify everybody uh, through our websites, through our Facebook group, and we'll give you information on how to sign up for that if you want to. Um, and you, were in, you should read them and you should comment on them because those comments do make a difference. Um, ESSA is going to be codified soon. And what that means is they'll take the total act and they'll decide where this goes in the United States code. And then we can see exactly if how Maylin and I are interpreting it is correct. I'm pretty sure we're right, um, but you're always surprised. We'll see how it fits in with the federal law. And then we can, we can also redistribute uh, the reference materials we previously created. We have a whole set of reference materials on how these three acts work and what the rights are of different groups, but we need to see that codification before we can, we can update that because we have references in the codification to, to the federal law and um, they, they include hyperlinks. So we, we will distribute an electronic copy or free to print off, but it also has hyperlinks in it, meaning you can click on it and just go to the law and read it for yourself. Um, we'll continue to post update materials as they become available. Um, post on our website, the in, this is the name of the group, our Facebook group, it's a closed group, Montana Indian Parent Committee's Facebook group. Um, this is our website, 
aclumontana.org. I didn't post Maylin's up there, um, but you go to the law school and click on Indian Law Clinic. It's a Marjorie Hunter Brown Indian Law Clinic. Um, this is the, the Facebook group, Montana Indian Parent Committees. It says it's a secret group. I'll tell you about it. But it just means it's not, you can't see it if you're not invited. But anybody that wants um, an invitation, uh, let us know, and we'll be glad to in invite you. There's about 50 Indian parents from around the state and, and, uh, and tribal ed departments from other parts of the state as well. Um, so that's my picture on Facebook. You just look, search for Jim Taylor, and if you see that, I'm there with my substantially more attractive wife. Um, we'll be glad to sign you up for the group. Uh, my email address, if you just want to email me at work, it's jimt, J-I-M-T, at A-C-L-U Montana, spelled out, dot O-R-G, jimt at A-C-L-U Montana, dot org. And May Lynn's is a little more complicated, but she's got cards. <laughs> and I think I have some cards as well. That's all I got. Thanks for attending. <laughs>